dealing with crescendo of awfulness situations. So this card was first written in 2010, and in 2024, I decided to revise this card today because I had just successfully concluded a crescendo of awfulness experience. So I wanted to add that real life context and what I learned from it um, to the revision process. So more about that soon. I Ching scholar Carol Anthony came up with the phrase crescendo of awfulness situations in her commentary on hexagram 26 in her wonderful A Guide to the I Ching. We've all been through situations where relations with others spiral out of control, get worse and worse, and seem to have their own dark momentum. In various crescendo of awfulness situations, we may be the prime instigator, someone else may be the prime instigator who pulls us in, or all parties contribute to the conflict. And of course, it could involve multiple parties as well. I'll focus more on the one-on-one -on -one for simplicity's sake, though. Whatever the cause of the crescendo of awfulness, we should tend to the basics. Keep breathing. Stay as calm as possible. Keep up all disciplines. And try to slow down the dark momentum, if possible, by being diplomatic, detached, impeccable, and centered in your own inner equilibrium. Once again, when possible. Uh, sometimes people just really push our buttons and, and we may have to then try and recover our equilibrium. If possible, try to be the calm center in the midst of the storm. Remind yourself of the classic phrase, this too shall pass. In a conflict that's gaining dark momentum, I try to do a fearless search for my thoughts in the situation and to own them to the other person as quickly as possible. The worst crescendo of awfulness situations are ones where we are responsible for a significant part of the fault and don't own it. These are the situations that can leave us with long-term guilt and regret. I try to get out in front of my faults by owning them as thoroughly as possible. And this is not only just, it minimizes long-term emotional fallout that I had unowned faults contributing to the awfulness. If you have been able to keep your inner dignity and discipline, and it seems like the other or others have been at fault, avoid becoming a righteous crusader. Have tolerance and patience for the mistakes of others. Give a wrongdoer a face-saving way out of the awful situation, if possible. And, uh, this helped me a lot when I was the Dean and Building Security Coordinator at a high school in the South Bronx, a public high school, during the crack epidemic. Um, you Often, um, it, it didn't seem possible that I would be breaking up fights uh, multiple times a day, often um, as a shorter guy. I was very fit at the time. Um, and where there were often large, tough inner city kids who are the combatants. But just getting between them often resolved the fight because it gave the one who was getting the worst of it a face-saving way out. And I could feel their body moving with me when I got between them because then they could, they could go back and say, I was going to kick that homeboy's ass, but Zap broke it up. You see? So if, if you want to de-escalate a conflict... A lot of times it's pride and machismo that's keeping people at it. Um, see if you can find a face-saving escape valve for them rather than one where you like prove them right, prove them wrong or whatever, and, and, and therefore humiliate them. That can be dangerous. Um, now, it's not going to work in every case, but I'm giving you a variety of strategies. The day before I revised this card... I had a classic crescendo of awfulness situation. Someone, not a close friend, but one I had known for nearly 30 years without conflict, unexpectedly broke a written agreement we had, and for highly neurotic reasons, exposing poor character. It was one of those cases where the fault was unambiguously on the other side. And that's usually not the case, but in this case, sometimes it is. 
I owned a tiny act of forgetfulness that was being used as a pretext and tried to be civil and give the other face-saving ways out of the conflicts. You know, I, I talked about ways that they had been honorable in the past and had been of value to me and, and this kind of thing and, you know, tried to, like, keep things on a civil level, but they were not going for it. Um, part of them probably knew they were wrong, and so they wanted to maintain this angry, enraged state to try and, like, get through their misdeed um, without listening. They informed me of their breach of, of our agreement, which is an agreement that they proposed, in rude words and by text. When I tried to call and in a diplomatic tone reason with them, they began rude and angry right from the beginning and then quickly hung up. Part of them knew what they were doing didn't hold up to scrutiny and therefore they didn't want to face me but preferred to use the disassociated method of texting. When someone wants to violate an agreement and chooses the flattest form of communication available, silence or SMS, it's a sign of bad faith. Conflict should not be allowed to escalate by a texting. You must see the classic Key and Peel skit on texting gone wrong, because um, I put a link in the card. Um, because often we, we completely misread text and people are not great writers and they're taking implications from the text that may or may not be there. If the conflict is escalating by texting, try for in-person communication. Next best would be a video call so both tone and facial expressions are visible. Even an audio call is not as dissociating as texting. If people are talking over each other and or monopolizing the time, insist on time turns of about three minutes where each party gets to speak uninterrupted. Um, so, for example, we do that at my household because, you know, homes with multiple people living in them often have ongoing conflicts. And so we've developed a protocol where, like, you know, something comes up, we really talk it out, um, it's heated, we'll do time turns. And then by at the end of it, we'll come up with a resolution and then we'll codify that resolution in writing and it, be, it becomes part of a shared household memo that then we can refer back to, you know, uh, to, to, to ensure that that particular source of conflict doesn't recur because we've already um, worked through it and established a boundary and now peace results. So it works extremely well at least because we also are lucky to have people of good faith who can listen, you know, when they're in the right state of mind and so forth. Um, <clears throat> they inform me of their breach of agreement. Okay, I think I read that. <clears throat> okay. If the conflict is escalating via texting... Never a good way to have, almost never a good way to have any kind of in-depth thing happen or high stakes thing happen in a relationship is by text. Like people who break up with each other by text, that's a real douchey move, right? Um, so try for in-person communication. Next best would be a video call so both tone and facial expressions are visible. We want to go for a high level of social um, feedback. Even an audio call is not as disassociating as texting. People are talking over each other and monopolizing the time. Insist on time turns of about three minutes where each party gets to speak uninterrupted. To encourage listening, suggest note-taking while the other is speaking. So I always ask for permission to do this because otherwise I lose my listening ability because I'm trying to know, oh, I got to bring this thing up. But now they brought up this and I got to bring up that thing and that thing. Pretty soon my working memory is gone and I'm, I'm not really paying attention because I'm trying to hold on to these points I want to refute or contribute or whatever. Um, <clears throat> Another great technique, if all parties have sufficient commitment to consciousness, is to have each person restate to the other's satisfaction, the points the other just made before they take a turn speaking. So this is sometimes called um, steel manning, I think, instead of straw manning. Straw manning is where rhetorically you um, create the, uh, 
a weak and inauthentic version of the um, other person's argument. Sometimes this is, takes the form of reducto absurdum, where we exaggerate and make it weak with satire or whatever, and then knock down the straw man. Steel manning is we state in our words the best possible version of their point of view to, to where they agree that I, you know, that I've stated their position um, to their satisfaction. And then they do this, would do the same for me. So this shows the other person, yeah, you've really listened. Um, here's what you, here are your points. Um, it doesn't mean I agree with them, but here they are. Here are your, your reasons, um, if any. And so I just want you to know that I really heard you. And here's the summary before I continue with my point of view. It's a great way to slow things down and to ensure that people have really heard each other correctly and, and listened and understood before we go on to another point counterpoint exchange. <clears throat> if things began spiraling out of control in person, long form written dialogue via email will definitely slow things down um, for those who are open to such a communication format. Writing often encourages people to be more thoughtful and considered and eliminates heated interruptions, etc. Now this can work well for me, but I'm also a writer, to be fair. Um, it, it can work really well with thoughtful people um, where we get out of the long, the, 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 um, the short form of heated texts back and forth and people really compose uh, an email that they proofread and um, really uh, develop their argument um, in this long form manner, and that can be very illuminating and harmony inducing. Again, any of these methods could fail or succeed depending on the case specific situation. <clears throat> After many exchanges where I retained some diplomacy and offered face saving and friendship preserving olive branches without anything of the kind being returned, became clear that the offending party, this was in my conflict happening yesterday and earlier today, was only going to double down on stupidity and self-righteous defense of an act of petty evil. It was time to conclude both the exchange and the connection with the offender um, and to do it with a sharp and funny, at least to me, rebuke that included a shadow x-ray of their bad character and its likely consequences. Um, now, this is also like my personality. I'm like, you know, from the Bronx, from a, a household of aggressive Socratic dialogue in the Ashkenazi Jewish tradition. And so um, sometimes that's appropriate. You know, it can be many other times I've used it where it wasn't appropriate because as Alistair Crowley says, if I tell a man something he's not ready to hear, it's the same as if I told him a lie. But sometimes it really is appropriate, like you're fighting... Um, an evil bureaucracy or in certain other situations. Um, so, losing my place here. Okay. Um, they deserve to get zapped, this person. It was, it was a case where, like, you know, and I had third parties, a very neutral, wise third party, verify the interaction to see if I'm missing any fault to myself in it. Somebody who calls me on my shadow all the time. Um, and they went, so when they take my side, um, I, I feel I've triangulated, you know, a bit. I, I, I'm, I feel quite reassured that, you know, this is not a case where there's some lacuna, there's some blind spot in me where I'm not seeing my faults in it. It was just like so clearly like this person just out of nowhere doing something um, bad um, um, because of an obvious corrupt reason. Um, I didn't set that up in any way or want it. Um, so they deserve to get zapped and they did. And the weakness of their comeback showed that I had gotten through not enough for them to reverse their foolish decision, but hopefully enough, so we're talking about somebody with a high IQ, that when they get to see the karma of their choice play out, there could be a slight chance of awakening. It's open to debate, but I feel confrontational aggression with the wrongdoer 
when they are not a threat to safety or reputation is sometimes warranted. Now notice that's a big parenthetical if there. Um, you don't want to do this where um, somebody can wreak a retribution on you with disastrous consequences. So although it's a book um, that could be said to be evil, since it's about how to use power for amoral or immoral purposes, Machiavelli's The Prince, but it's very, like Sun Tzu's Art of War, it's very um, strategically wise. So one of the things that uh, Machiavelli wrote that I remember is don't do any sort of vengeance on anyone, no matter how wrong they are, um, if, if, if they can come back with something, uh, come, come back on you with another retribution, because then you're just in a cycle of violence and, and you may be the one that suffers. So, for example, when mafia dons, who, who, some of whom were familiar with um, Machiavelli's The Prince, these are not dumb people, um, to get to that position of power, um, this is why they would not just kill a man, but all of his sons as well, not recommending this, um, <clears throat> to ensure that they, they wouldn't get assassinated. So in other words, if they're gonna if they're gonna whack somebody, they're going to like really whack them um, and make sure that they're, they're not gonna like um, punch him in the face where they can then pick themselves up and come back with more force later. Um, because they've been humiliated. So this is the problem with um, vengeance, is it's strategically unwise if, if it's going to put you in danger. So there, there was a situation at a festival a few years ago where um, uh, somebody was kind of being bullying, and I really wanted to put them in their place. And conversationally, I certainly could have done that, but I was getting red flags that this person might be dangerous. And therefore, it was better for me to swallow my pride and walk away and avoid them. Because though I had two people put guns to my head, and head in, in, uh, during the blackout of 1977, I somehow managed to like grow up in the Bronx and like work in the South Bronx and remain bullet free. And um, I would really like to continue that. And so, if, and we live in a, especially in the United States, in a place where gun violence is a real factor. And um, you really want to be careful about not letting, not um, getting into road rage or something where the person might pull out a gun. They might be a total punk, which may tempt you to want to like, you know, uh, confront them. But um, a punk with a 9mm can fill, fill you full of 9mm holes. Um, so it's just not worth it. Okay. So, once again, it's open to debate, but I feel confrontational aggression with the wrongdoer when they are not a threat to safety or reputation is sometimes warranted. There are times when people need pushback, or at least deserve it. While the ultimate effect of a rebuke on them is unknown, it, in this case, made me feel better, knowing I'd made my point. I added a silent blessing that the sharpness of my rebuke might eventually help them self-correct, and then I made that blessing explicit and wished them well. And then I felt perfectly at peace and ready to move on and make creative use of the crescendo of awfulness experience I just had with them um, by having a relevant context in which to revise this card written in 2010, and I'm revising it here in 2014. If someone you are connected to by deep inner ties which was not the case here. You know, this was an, a kind of a minor friendship where, um, you know, the stakes were not, not like a, you know, blood relative or long-term close relationship where, you know, you would do everything to salvage it. Um, um, so if someone you're connected to by deep inner ties persists in inappropriate action, the best response is often to lovingly withdraw energy from them. And that's more or less still what I did in this case, too. This withdrawal of energy could be anything from breaking eye contact during a conversation, which is a withdrawal of energy, 
walking out of the room, or even going your own way for a lifetime. Now, it might not seem like my sharp, funny rebuke was loving, but loving doesn't necessarily mean warm and cuddly and fuzzy. Um, <clears throat> I gave him a very appropriate response, one that really gave him very accurate feedback about what he was doing wrong, why he was doing it, and why it would not help him in the long term. That's very related, and I think lo loving for the circumstance, um, because I gave a very appropriate and carefully worded response. Um, to withdraw lovingly means that you do not judge the other as hopeless and assume that they will never change. And that's how I view this former friend of mine. Um, he's an intelligent person. He may um, come around because it seems so likely that what he just did and the purpose he did it for is going to blow up on him. And, and maybe, maybe he'll wake up with that. But very likely he won't because he's been stuck in the same patterns for decades. To do so only helps, so to, to, but to execute them in their mind in I Ching terms, um, it's a metaphor meaning to view them as hopeless, um, <clears throat> only helps to imprison them in their present eclipse. Instead, we tried to cling to the image of the offending person when they were at their best or when we glimpsed their highest potential. This does not mean, however, that we grant them trust based on this potential. Trust has to be earned by deeds. And if somebody has wronged me enough, you know, like that saying, you know, uh, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Um, <clears throat> so um, in another crescendo of awfulness situation where a person had done the same thing twice, but after the first time had apologized a lot and given all these seemingly sincere confessions of fault, but then um, did it a third time. Now, they, they, if they were to try and enter my orbit again, it, it, a, a mere apology would not be enough. They would have to do something to make amends. Just as if I wronged somebody egregiously, I would not feel an apology was sufficient. I would want to do something for them to make amends. Okay. <clears throat> um, in some cases, when the offending person is actively hurting others, for example, it may be necessary to confront them and intervene more actively. If the offending person makes reparative gestures or otherwise returns to appropriate behavior, meet them halfway and allow um, their return without erecting special hurdles for them to cross. If we are the offending person, primarily or partially, and that's often the case, right? We need to allow, for most of us, we need to allow ourselves to be changed and positively transformed by the painful lessons of the crescendo of awfulness situation. So the way I keep, you know, regrets um, is to as fully as possible and go over the top in owning any part of the fault that's mine and then to like make really decisive changes. And then I don't feel regret because I know I like addressed it. I made amends if necessary, apologized, whatever needed to be done. We learn from history to avoid repeating it, but we do not look back paralyzed by self-recrimination and irreconcilable regret. Paralyzed reflection can take, contains secret elements of pride we cannot, we cannot relinquish our perfectionism and accept that we have transgressed. It is part of the human condition to transgress, and we need to recognize ourselves as part of that, just as others are. I'm going to screw up. Sometimes it's going to be my fault. I need to own that, accept it, work with it, be changed by it, learn from it, apologize, make amends, do whatever, and move on. Paralyzed regret is also a form of laziness. Allowing ourselves to be changed by the awful situation, we move forward with renewed commitment toward the good. We make amends where possible to those we have wronged, emphasize making energetic progress in the good, and stay vigilant to avoid further transgressions. Knowing we'll never do that perfectly, like always ready to like, oh, the first sign of negative feedback from anybody, I'm like, oh, damn. Did I do that? Like, you know, first let me look for faults in myself um, before 
I look for faults in them. Um, it is best to recognize crescendo of awfulness situations while they are happening and make immediate course corrections. That's why we try and de-escalate and take down the heat so that we can have that time alone to think, you know, how, how if in any way, we've contributed to it. If our dark emotions, compulsions, addictions, or reactive habits are in play, then we must quietly and humbly recognize we have gotten off track and return to our path as quickly as possible. Gain a calm, compassionate view of the situation. And don't take decisive action until you can feel compassion for all concerned. So there's a wonderful um, samurai parable that illustrates this, um, where you know, a, a samurai's master has been assassinated. So now it's his duty to assassinate the assassin. So the samurai goes and like carefully stalks this man and then finds him alone on a street, pulls out his samurai sword, is about to decapitate him or something, but the man spits on him. He puts the sword back in his sheath and walks away. So it's, it's really more of a parable than something that would likely actually happen, of course. But the idea is like it's meant to provoke you into thinking like, why did he do that? Why did he just see, sheathe the sword and walk away? It's because when the man spit on him, he became emotionally agitated and involved and it would no longer be a pure act. So this is kind of a very metaphorical way of, of, of in, in conversation that like, <clears throat> if we're in a state of extreme agitation, if we're having, you know, what cognitive psychologists call a schema attack, where we've really been triggered and are reacting with like our classic grooved patterns of emotional reactivity, don't act. Be like, hey, I need some space. Like break off the communication so you've regained your equilibrium because otherwise it's like driving drunk. You're going to do something that you may really regret. And this is how relationships get blown up. They get hotter and hotter until people go with some nuclear option and, you know, and, and there's fallout for years from that. It is best to, so we, I guess I read that, um, consider this an auspicious time to up your game in dealing with crescendo of awfulness experiences and situations.